Uh, welcome everybody, happy new year. Today we're continuing our study of the life of Bayard Rustin by talking about his peace and anti-nuclear work. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to give kind of a high level overview as a friendly reminder about where we've been so far this year and where we're headed. Bayard Rustin, we talked about his prison organizing. In December, we talked about anti-colonialism and had a really excellent panel on that. Today we'll do peace and anti-nuclear. Uh, next up in February, Chloe will lead our study of his LGBTQ ministry. So, um, and you know, we, we talk about this every time we talk about Rustin, the, the, the interconnectedness of so many parts of his life and his story. And I don't wanna step on anybody else's toes by saying too much too soon, um, but uh, just be, be calm, just chill. It's gonna come in the next few months and hopefully by the time May rolls around, we're gonna have a great um, big picture view of uh, this person's amazing life. Um, it's difficult, you could imagine if you've attended any of these sessions with us so far, it's difficult to talk about peace or pacifist work with Rustin in a capsule because it is a theme and an effort that goes across his entire life. I just wanted to kind of read off some bullet points. He did the summer training with, with AFSC called the Institute of International Relations. He did a Quaker Peace Education Immersion Program in Philadelphia. He worked at the Fellowship of Reconciliation, which is a non-denominational pacifist organization. He worked at the War Resister League, which is a secular pacifist organization. He was there for 12 years. Um, of course, in the past, we've talked about him being a conscientious objector during World War II and having to serve time for that. And we've talked about his uh, study of nonviolent direct action and how he used uh, that to challenge bus segregation and to um, help guide the civil rights movement more, more broadly. So, Rustin has a very broad experience in what I think we would call peace work, but for the sake of our time together, you know, I'm sure if you were off of mute, I would hear a sigh of relief. I'm just going to focus on four um, efforts of his peace and anti-nuclear work, mostly picking up in the 1950s. Um, I think that this is going to be an easier way to kind of chunk it out and talk about the themes and what we can learn from, from each of these uh, um, kind of flashpoints in his life. Look, okay, so these are the four things I want to talk about. First, I want to talk about this amazing thing that happened in 58 called the Delegation to Moscow. Number two, I want to talk about the Sahara Project, which has details in it that would rival anything coming out of Hollywood in the action and adventure space. Um, number three, the International Peace Walk that happened in 1960. And then finally, I want to talk uh, more more broadly, maybe about his uh, position relative to the anti uh, Vietnam War or the v Vietnam War protest movement, um, kind of starting in the '60s. So that's an outline for today. I'm going to try to keep these uh, nicely contained, and then um, at the end we'll get together for some for three queries that we've drafted. Okay, so first I want to talk about this delegation to Moscow in 1958. I'll pick up. Um, you know, this is right kind of after the Korean War. Um, the American pacifist movement was reactivated at the end of the 50s for the first time in a while. And Rustin came in with this unique background and um, valuable experiences that really uh, assisted the anti-nuclear movement and helped it get a strong foothold at this time. Remember, he had studied Ghanaian nonviolent resistance in India he was coming off a wave of enthusiasm and success of the Montgomery bus boycotts, um, which he had assisted um, in advising on. And he had made a great personal sacrifice to be a conscientious objector in World War II. So he's coming in with a pretty unique skill set um, to the late 1950s anti nuclear movement. It was a unique time um, in American history because there was a disparate political ideology coalescing in American pacifism. Like, Rustin was so frustrated that American pacifism didn't have a political home. Um, he looked uh, with, with a great envy at other countries that had political parties that would really step up um, for pacifism and, and saw that the American landscape was lacking that. Um, a lot of the American peace organizations, including AFSC, 
and the War Resisters League, which is where Rustin was working at the time, they met in the late 1950s and they said, what are we going to do about anti-nuclear stuff? We have got to get together and work together on this stuff. And they agreed, or they, they saw very early that there were really two minds here. Some people were more comfortable with public education and awareness. Um, and some people really wanted to like take it to the mat in nonviolent direct action. Mm -hmm. um, the first group of people, um, uh, and there was a collegial separate and, and pursue, pursue these two different tactics separately. People from the first group um, focused on public education and awareness. They formed the Committee for Sane Nuclear Policy that got great traction and uh, had a lot of membership in the coming decade. Um, the other route, which focused on high profile actions and nonviolent direct action, this is where Rustin ended up, obviously. And they did things like um, commissioning a, a ship to, to go out into a nuclear test site in the South Pacific to try to disrupt the testing out there. And this is one of my favorite of their efforts. They um, organized a, delega a delegation to Moscow. And it was gonna be a tour of Europe, stopping in all the major cities, uh, trying to engage citizens and leaders in conversation about you know, how crazy it was that this multinational nuclear arms race was heating up after what we had seen um, at the end of World War II. Um, this group formed the Committee for Nonviolent Action, CNVA. I'll try to refer to it as its full name as much as I can, because I know the um, acronyms are really piling up <laughs> this year for us. Um, so this delegation of pacifists traveled to European cities, a huge march in London with 10,000 people, a very well attended rally at Trafalgar Square. Um, Rustin in leading this and messaging this delegation to Moscow was adamant about um, how these efforts connected uh, with what Gandhi was working on in India and also the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. We'll see that in a lot of his anti-nuclear work. He uh, told the crowd to think about, uh, beyond na nationhood and see themselves as part of a common humanity. They went to Paris. Um, France was really in turmoil right now around the anti-nuclear work because they had declared that they would pursue a nuclear uh, weapon program and they would do it by testing these weapons in the deserts of Algeria, which was one of their colonies. And this created a lot of consternation really in Africa and around the globe. The delegation though did not have an auspicious end. Um, remember that uh, Rustin is the logistics guy. So he's trying to get all the visas and the travel papers and the travel arrangements coordinated for a big delegation moving around Europe, an entire continent. And when they get to Finland, which is where they were expecting to receive their visas to get into Moscow, the visas weren't there. They waited for weeks. He was just badgering every official he could get his hands on. The, the visas weren't there. The visas never showed up. There was no explanation. Um, and it's, it's funny to remember, like in the middle of the Cold War, if you broke outside of the expectations about, about how, how you were supposed to be messaging as coming from the West or anything else, it raised a lot of suspicion. People really were expecting more rigid positions. Um, and so the thought is really just that um, the USSR at the time did not, they were just confounded by the message of this group of pacifists moving across the continent and they did not want any part of it. They did not want to get involved or encourage uh, more conversation um, within their borders about the nuclear arms race. So again, what can we learn um, from Rustin's work um, on this delegation to Moscow. Um, it was in 1958. And to me, I think um, the most unique lesson of this, this uh, flashpoint in his life was his meticulous planning, um, his oratory, his hyper awareness about messaging to the media and how that needed to be so good. Um, his enthusiasm in connecting the anti-nuclear cause with what else was going on around the globe and the swell of success that was behind him coming out of the Montgomery bus boycotts 
all of these things were really giving Rustin a unique portfolio of skills and experiences. It gave him more credibility. He had the tactical skills to pull off the planning of this delegation to Moscow. And even though it didn't make it to Moscow, it had very effective messaging in the papers um, across Europe. And so um, that's what I would like to offer as the lesson from this first um, anti-nuclear thing we're studying here, which is, you know, what, what are the unique attributes he had coming into this moment? How enormous did the task seem? And in our own lives, um, how, you know, how often are we not giving credence to our own unique um, experiences and skills uh, to bring to the table? It kind of reminds me of, um, of the song we sang this morning about doing what the spirits they do and the reticence to do that sometimes. Um, second, I want to talk about my favorite, and I'll try to keep it short, but the Sahara Project uh, was a plan that was proposed by the British pacifist organizations in 1958. This is in response to France saying that they were developing nuclear weapons and they were testing them in the Sahara Desert of Algeria. It was going to be um, an atmospheric, like an above ground test. And when this, like I just mentioned a moment ago, when this came to light, the outrage across the continent was just out of this world. Um, and so the British pacifists, I don't know where these, I don't know where they got these crazy ideas, but they, they had this idea to send um, a, a foray of people up through, uh, up through the Sahara Desert to the test site to disrupt the nuclear testing efforts of France there at the time. Um, when this was discussed at the, at the CNVA office in the United States, some of the people were like, you know, don't even talk about this. Don't, don't daydream about it. Don't start thinking about it. This is a waste of our time to even think about it because it is so outlandish because they're thinking about this. How are you going to access, you know, 2000 miles through the desert border issues, um, all the logistics of getting by and staying healthy in the desert while you're traveling. And also the French military at the time was just vicious, like beyond all um, measure, they were just vicious. So a lot of African, um, a lot of African activists had already learned really difficult lessons in their interactions with the French military. So they were reluctant to, to get involved. Um, the general, the initial sense from the United States is that this is a fantasy, do not get involved. But the British activists very wisely met with Rustin and he was intrigued because he really liked the idea of emphasizing the direct link between the campaign against nuclear weapons and the struggle of African people for freedom from their colonizers. And so, you know, at one point CNVA, uh, the board passed a resolution saying we are not getting involved just three weeks later, Rustin persuaded them to change their minds and uh, they came up with a resolution of support. So again, we see that his skills of persuasion um, are, are really helping to change the course of history here. Um, so he, he was loaned to the British uh, pacifist organizations for eight weeks to help plan. He went to London and there was a lot to do. They had, um, he had to mend relationships with the African communities in London. He had to fundraise from other nations who wanted to support their efforts, but didn't want it to be publicized. They didn't want to be connected to the effort. Um, he traveled to Ghana, which he had previously been at in the early 1950s before independence there. And um, uh, over and over, you see people talking about how exhilarated Rustin is at this, at this organizing because um, it's as if he's helping to organize the entire continent around this issue. Uh, they're getting support from all these different countries, Nigeria, Guinea, Cameroon. Um, they're getting support from the entire continent. And it, it really feels like uh, meaningful and like a sweet spot for him in his organizing. Um, and so the Sahara Project had like 19 protesters go up through French West Africa into Algeria. It was a 2,100 mile trip. Uh, they had a great rally, rally in Accra before they left Ghana. Um, and they made, it seems like the end, the end thing here is that they just had a little game of cat and mouse with the French military when they were on French territory. So they were not successful in actually reaching the intended test site, but they had drawn a huge amount of attention to the French nuclear testing 
program. And they, there were successes out of this project. Um, they united a lot of African um, groups in their resistance to nuclear testing on the continent and furthermore to colonialism um, in general. Um, there were protests, really large protests around the whole continent in the months and the year that followed. There were um, resolutions coming out of French labor unions condemning the testing plan. So when, when you stop here and you say, what, what is the lesson from this um, element of Rustin's anti-nuclear work? I think it's this. Um, he said in a couple of speeches, something to the effect of, you've got to use whatever is required to bring our government to its senses. You have to use your bodies in direct action, non-cooperation, whatever you have. And so here, I don't pretend that there was a plan to actually um, you know, uh, destroy the nuclear warheads or whatever that were in, in the Algerian desert, but it was the awareness and the opportunity to educate um, so many people watching what they were doing that I think that is what he had in that moment. This is what the, what the movement had to bring attention to anti-nuclear efforts. Um, third, I wanna talk, kind of go back to the theme of this international peace walk. Uh, this is going to sound a lot like the first thing we talked about, which was the delegation to Moscow, but this one is even more extreme. It was a nine-month march of, um, at times, many thousands of people marching from San Francisco all the way to Moscow. And when this idea was first posited in the offices of the War Resisters League, Rustin was like, listen, I have done this. No, don't, I don't, don't talk about it. This is not a good idea. But um, even since the delegation to Moscow, there was so much happening that we still talk about today. There was uh, the Bay of Pigs, the uh, Vienna summit of international leaders disintegrated when Khrushchev kind of stormed off in great anger. Kennedy was expanding the uh, nuclear arsenal. There were nuclear submarines docking off the coast of New London, Connecticut. In India, Nehru was rapidly militarizing against China and Tibet. Um, and so this is really the environment. The, the issue wasn't over. This was not a repeat performance. Um, I, think, I think Rustin really had the sense that the world was hurtling towards large scale destruction. And he felt, oh, you know, so like I said, he had initially objected to the planning of this international peace walk it somehow moved forward and then he was requested by name to help lead the European leg of the trip. Um, and so he got involved um, and maybe not with great joy. Some of his colleagues working on this at the time said that some of his, um, he was kind of caustic and contemptuous because he was having to wrangle, just the, he was having to wrangle materials out of um, his American colleagues. Um, and he had already seen firsthand how fractious the peace movement was in Eastern Europe in particular. Um, for instance, there was this English anti-nuclear leader who was not supportive of direct action and he would not sponsor the event. The French pacifist community was so absorbed in the Algerian movement for independence that they really could not even get involved. When the march came to France, they weren't even allowed in the borders because um, there was a fear that France was in like a meltdown, civil war meltdown, and could not deal with one more distraction. Um, and also the German pacifist community had splintered. A lot of the leaders there were not even on speaking terms. Um, and also, this is a, a fun little uh, detail, a lot of the international community was um, angry, was like almost in disbelief that CNVA had initiated this march, which was logistically, imagine how complicated it would be before email, but that CNVA had initiated this march without conferring with any of their international partners. Um, so a lot of the people, a lot of the rooms that Rustin was walking into, they just felt like CNVA was so presumptuous not to have consulted with them in advance. Um, so this, um, this international peace walk um, had visa problems, but it wasn't like the one in 1958. Rustin himself had his visa yanked by the, uh, by the UK and he had to leave before the march even came to that part of Europe. Um, so he had to have a colleague finish the trip. The group did get into Moscow. So that was a nice uh, change from the one that happened in 1958. But 
even as the march was happening over nine months, Bay of Pigs was in the news, the Khrushchev debacle. Um, despite everybody's best efforts, they could not really keep their protest march on the front page and in people's thoughts and conversations because the current events around nuclear war at the time was just, um, just crazy and unmanageable. So asking ourselves kind of like, what is the lesson from the International Peace Walk? Um, I think it has to do with this quote from a Rustin speech that he gave in Trafalgar Square, which is, you know, we must act, we must act now, even though we do not always see the future clearly. Um, like I said before, Rustin really had the sense that the world was moving towards large scale destruction. And when he was asked to plan the European leg of this trip, he probably had a sense of the logistical nightmares, but I think that he felt that it was more important to act than, than to sit around and, uh, and, uh, and not. So finally, this is a, a pretty interesting segment and not really congruous with the, the three that we've previously done in terms of modules, but I wanted to talk about the Vietnam War and um, where Rustin found himself in relation to the, to the, the anti-war movement happening in the United States at the time. Um, it's pretty interesting to think that on the day that Lyndon Johnson was inside the White House signing the Voting Rights Act into law, Bayard Rustin was inside the White House and a lot of his friends and colleagues from the pacifist community were outside the White House protesting what was happening in Southeast Asia. And they couldn't believe that he would, would turn like this. Um, for some pacifists, this was a real break in um, a parting of the ways they would say with Rustin. Uh, when Rustin was at the War Resisters League, which um, kind of had an appetite for more militant uh, if that's probably not the best choice, but like really active um, pacifist actions. Um, when Rustin was working there, he did speak out freely against the Vietnam War. There was a letter, um, uh, this is all from me reading books, some of y'all might have specific memories at this time, about the generational split. And um, uh, Rustin had signed on to a letter against, uh, well, to the Students for a Democratic Society, they were going to host a big rally, an anti-nuclear rally, I'm sorry, an anti-Vietnam War rally, and Rustin and a lot of other leaders, kind of older leaders in the pacifist organizations, um, signed on, encouraging them in their protests or the demonstration against Vietnam, and also flagging a concern about the involvement of any communists. Um, and uh, Rustin and his colleagues who had been around in the working in pacifist causes since the 1930s had learned this lesson the hard way about, um, about what, what the consequences were of working with communists, both in censure from the US government and, um, and the communist parties uh, change on positions of racism that had happened a long time ago. Um, but you know, another big change that had happened in Rustin's life is that at this time is that he had left the War Resisters League and he had gone to work at the Randolph Institute. And that's where he would finish out his professional life. Randolph Institute was funded by AFL-CIO and um, Rustin was very excited about working with the US labor movement to affect greater change. And so, you know, he was politically savvy. He, he knew what he was doing. This was no accident that he was not uh, inserting himself in the anti-Vietnam War protests um, the way that some of his colleagues were. Um, but the generational split here is really interesting to me. Imagine knowing what we know about Rustin from the early part of his life to see that he was being attacked from the left um, and to see that he was uh, being attacked by younger people seemingly who did not want to acknowledge that he had actually served time as a conscientious objector. I want to read you a couple of quotes um, from op-eds that were published attacking Rustin for his position on Vietnam. One said that Rustin's strategy was a kind of elitism. One said he was intending to disempower ordinary people. Uh, one said he was a labor lieutenant of capitalism. And one said he was encouraging a coalition with the Marines. So, um, so he was really uh, kind of out in the forefront and, and open to attack from a lot of the, the Vietnam War protesters. 
Um, but I would like to point out, as the author of the book we read uh, did, that Rustin was consistent in his message. He personally and repeatedly reaffirmed his commitment to pacifism and condemned the violence. He censured both sides of the violent conflict, which is how he had dealt with these situations his whole life. He saw that pacifism uh, did not have a political home. It was outside the conventions of left and right. And so he wanted to focus at that point on other political goals, seeing the political landscape as it was. Um, he and his colleagues in the civil rights movement saw the connection between Vietnam and the civil rights movement, the struggle for civil rights, but they did not yet think that either of these movements had the authority to speak for the other or to overlap 100%. Um, and finally, you know, his condemnation of Western imperialism, imperialism was longstanding and nonviolent. Um, and so I would just say he seemed to have made a strategic decision not to get involved in the Vietnam protests. And he was judged pretty harshly for this. Um, as a teaser, I wanna say that this is something we're gonna talk about a lot more when Jade presents in a couple of months on his work in labor organizing, because that's really where the full, uh, hit, the full picture will, will come into, into view. So um, if we were to ask ourselves, what is there to learn about Bayard Rustin's position on Vietnam? Um, based on his own writings and those of uh, his friends at the time, I think it might challenge us to closely examine the tendency uh, to where we might be demanding moral purity or, or perfectionism from activists or leaders of a movement. Rustin had already lost his reputation for, at one point for being gay. He had lost three plus years of his um, freedom for causes he believed in. He'd been arrested many dozens of times. Um, uh, so, you know, what do we what do we expect of leaders and how much of that is um, is reasonable? So um, to conclude this part, we've learned about kind of four case studies from Rustin's piecework and anti-nuclear work, the delegation to Moscow in 1958, the Sahara Project, also 58, the International Peace Walk in 1960, and the Vietnam War, um, where he kind of where he Kind of had a different a different position. Um, and I guess I want to flip the script and say that in our committee preparing for this session, um, uh, we were called to ask ourselves, you know, is Rustin doing too much here? He's not going to be beyond, he's not going to be like beyond our scrutiny. Um, we want to really ask ourselves, um, was he just doing the things that he was really, really good at doing, like the strategy and the organizing and the logistics? Um, was he not discerning where he was most needed? Uh, you know, as we're reading these books, we don't, I don't remember seeing a time where the, the historical record shows, Rustin said, let's chill for two months and come back and, you know, or let's, let's, uh, let me discern this. So this is something, you know, uh, when you dig into his work around anti-nuclear, it, it can be overwhelming and it just seems like so much is happening even in one year. And so I think um, this is a, an important question for Quakers, and it's okay if you're having the same thoughts and the same questions um, as these months go on and as we talk about the sheer volume of work that Bayard Rustin did and the work that he got involved in. It's a lot. It's, it's okay to ask these questions, I guess, is what our committee wants to reinforce to y'all today. Um, and so that takes us to the queries. Um, one question is, do you ever hesitate to get involved in issues that seem overwhelming? How should a faith community respond to power being used to dehumanize, destroy, and oppress? Number two, do we ask each other for help finding clearness on our activism? How can a faith community support us in being intentional and effective? And then number three, Rustin said, we must act now, even if we do not see the future clearly. What issues urgently call out to you to act now, even where you cannot see the outcome? 